I'm David Bowes, and I'm pleased to welcome you all here. Um, we're here to discuss a new book, The Age of Abundance, How Prosperity Transformed America's Politics and Culture. It also has this other line up here that says, Why the Culture Wars Made Us More Libertarian. I read this book when it was in manuscript, and it is great. I kept uh, asking for more chapters as they were being written. I found it a fascinating social, political, economic, and cultural history of the past 50 or 60 years. And for me, it brings back lots of memories. Um, if you're younger than I am, it'll fill in your cultural education about what happened in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s. And some of that actually was uh, filling in my cultural understanding, my cultural education. There would be explanations of names and events and people that I'd sort of heard of but didn't really uh, know much about. So part of what the book does is give you this social cultural history of the post-war era. But it also brings all of that history together at the end to a conclusion that's maybe not often heard around the Cato Institute. <clears throat> which is that in many ways the upheavals of the 60s and the 80s and the surrounding decades have brought us to a sort of libertarian synthesis. Not exactly what Ira Levin called this perfect day, but at least a pretty good day. Um, a world of mostly open societies and mostly open economies. I've done some work recently on what I call the libertarian vote, and we've found that that a significant percentage of the American public votes in relatively libertarian uh, terms, but I never thought of them as the majority. Um, this argues that uh, they may actually be the swing vote, the center vote, and therefore a significantly influential group, which has something to do with why our culture has gotten to the point that we are. It's a fascinating book, and you should read it. But meanwhile, we will hear a discussion of it from the author, Brink Lindsay, who is Cato's Vice President for Research. He helps to oversee our research agenda and develop new research programs. Before he took that job, he was the founding director of Cato's Center for Trade Policy Studies, which makes the case for free trade policies in the United States and around the world. Before that, he was an attorney involved in international, regulation, uh, international trade and also um, senior editor of Regulation Magazine, published here at Cato. He's the author of two previous books. One is a great discussion of globalization in the 20th century called Against the Dead Hand, The Uncertain Struggle for Global Capitalism. And with our colleague Dan Eikenson, he also wrote a book on anti-dumping uh, laws. Commenting on today's talk will be David Brooks, who, as you know, is a columnist for the New York Times. Uh, under their new schedule, I believe, his columns appear every Tuesday and Friday. Uh, he worked for nine years at the Wall Street Journal. He also worked at the Weekly Standard. Um, he is now ubiquitous on government broadcasting. Uh, <laughs> The, the News Hour, All Things Considered, Diane Rehm, whenever you turn them on, there you will see David Brooks uh, as the token conservative, um, which annoys some limited government conservatives uh, since David is well known for his uh, endorsement of national greatness conservatism. But the reason he's here today, the reason he's the right person to have here today is that he is a brilliant social reporter or journalistic sociologist. He's the author of two books, Bobo's in Paradise, The New Upper Class and How They Got There, and On Paradise Drive, How We Live Now and Always Have in the Future Tense. Both of those demonstrate his ability to understand the cultural changes of the past 50 years and how they got us where we are. But for right now, please welcome the author of The Age of Abundance, Brink Lindsay. <laughs> Thanks, David. It's a great pleasure to be here with you today, and it's a special pleasure to share the podium with David Brooks, whose truly wonderful book, uh, Bobos in Paradise, uh, had a big influence on my thinking about the the cultural fusion that has taken place over the past couple of decades. Dire warnings about rising economic insecurity uh, are increasingly prominent these days. Uh, 
Uh, the litany of ills, both real and imagined, should be familiar to just about anyone who even casually follows the news. Uh, the outsourcing of jobs overseas, 47 million people without health insurance, a shrinking middle class, and widening inequality of income and wealth. And the overall economy may be doing fine, but most Americans are failing to benefit. At least that's what Lou Dobbs at CNN and Paul Krugman at the New York Times and many others uh, keep telling us. Well, I'm here to tell you, don't buy in to the doom and gloom. There's no doubt about it, our country has plenty of problems. Uh, but of all the things we could be worried about, the general level of material welfare for middle-class Americans ought to be pretty near the bottom of the list. The overall American standard of living, not just for people at the top, but for people in the middle as well, is higher and generally substantially higher than that in even the richest of other countries. And the bounty of American affluence continues to pile up. There's a popular misconception uh, that holds that uh, living standards have been stagnating in this country since the early 1970s. But that's simply not true. It's not even close. Let's start with the basics. Life expectancy uh, at birth uh, was 69 years in 1970. It's up to uh, 76 years today as the age-adjusted death rate uh, has plummeted more than 30%. Over the same time period, the number of Americans 25 years or older with a college or advanced degree has more than doubled from 11% to 28%. Meanwhile, the home ownership rate has increased from 63% to 69%, even as the size of the median new home has grown by nearly 60%. And Americans have been filling up those big new houses with gobs of new consumer goodies. Back in 1971, 45% of American households had clothes dryers, 19% had dishwashers, 83% had refrigerators, 32% had air conditioning, and 43% had color TVs. By the mid-1990s, all of these ownership rates had been surpassed by Americans below the poverty line. And let's not forget all the stuff that wasn't available to anybody uh, a generation ago. Personal computers, the World Wide Web, cell phones, cable and satellite TV, DVDs and iPods, airbags, anti-lock brakes, automatic teller machines, aspartame, LASIK surgery, CAT scans, ultrasounds, uh, home pregnancy tests, ibuprofen, Viagra, and on and on and on. It's simply ridiculous to claim that ordinary Americans are huddled on some howling plane of deprivation, risk, and uncertainty. Compared to whom? Compared to when? This kind of poor mouthing of our economic circumstances isn't just wrong, it's unseemly, like a tantrum thrown by a spoiled little rich kid. Our main problems today are not shortages of material goods. On the contrary, our main problems arise from our failure to fully adapt to a world in which material goods have become so plentiful. This lag shouldn't be too surprising. The fact is, uh, before America in the years after World War II, there had never been a society in human history in which the vast majority of people were neither impoverished nor directly dependent on the vagaries of nature for their basic uh, material needs. As the post-war boom took off, America stood revealed as something entirely new under the sun, a society in which the unprecedented development of technology and organization had effectively insulated most people from poverty and the forces of nature. In other words, we entered uncharted territory. The rest of the world is now following in our footsteps. America's achievement of mass prosperity is the leading edge of a global phenomenon. The struggle to move from poverty to plenty, from scarcity to abundance, is the drama of globalization, and that is the central drama of our times. But America has different struggles and different dramas. We reached mass prosperity six decades ago, and ever since we've been pushing farther and farther into this uncharted, unexplored territory. Our challenge is to adapt our culture, our values, and our politics to the opportunities and dangers of this new realm. At the heart of this process of adaptation has been a change in the basic orientation in the dominant culture, from a culture of overcoming scarcity to a culture of enjoying and expanding abundance, from a more rigid and repressed social system geared to achieving prosperity to a looser and more expressive one geared to taking wider advantage of prosperity's possibilities. In other words, from a culture of self-restraint to a culture of self-expression. <clears throat> 
Consumer capitalism is often derided as banal or superficial, but it has unleashed convulsive social change. The civil rights movement and the sexual revolution, environmentalism and feminism, the healthcare and fitness booms and the opening of the gay closet, the withering of censorship and the rise of a creative class of knowledge workers. All of these are the progeny of widespread prosperity. Meanwhile, just as economic dynamism uh, has spurred cultural dynamism, cultural change has turned around and accelerated the pace of economic change. In particular, the revival of American entrepreneurship since the 1970s, most spectacularly in Silicon Valley and the rest of the IT economy, bears the unmistakable stamp of the counterculture's irreverent disdain for authority and bureaucracy. As I said, it's just plain perverse to claim that American life suffers from a lack of material bounty. The deficits we do suffer from in America today, the things we really should be worrying about, are not material, but cultural. Too many Americans have not yet adapted to the cultural requirements of the age of abundance. Specifically, they lack the values, skills, and habits needed to thrive in an affluent society of high productivity and proliferating choices. This problem is most acutely visible in the dysfunction and despair of the nation's underclass. Dropping out of high school, having children outside of marriage, and failing to get a job, these, this trio of bad decisions defines and perpetuates the culture of poverty. In 2005, 12.6% of all Americans fell below the poverty line. But for those who had failed to complete high school, the figure jumped to 21.6%. That, si that same year, 36.2% of families headed by a single female were defined as poor, compared to only 6.5% of married couple families. And only 2.8% of adults with a full-time year-round job fell below the poverty line. Another less stark cultural barrier is the one that separates those who have invested heavily in upgrading their human capital and those who have not. In today's highly complex information economy, the returns to investing in high skills have grown by leaps and bounds. Back in 1980, college graduates earned about 40% more uh, than workers who had completed high school, and people with graduate degrees earned about 60% more. Today, the college premium is up to 60%, and the grad school premium has soared above 110%. In this new environment, Children uh, who were not raised to apply themselves and conscientiously develop their talents over the course of their lifetime are in danger of being left behind. So looking forward, we need to lift up the Americans on the bottom half of the socioeconomic scale. Or rather, we need to work to establish conditions in which more of them will lift themselves up and adapt, adopt the values, habits, and skills that are the keys to taking advantage of uh, contemporary America's <laughs> staggering opportunities. We need to improve the development of human capital by injecting competition into the moribund monopoly of state-run education. We need to, incur to end the encouragement of criminality, now provided by our misguided war on drugs. And we need to facilitate assimilation into the middle class by immigrants, which means first and foremost, liberalizing immigration and thereby reducing the number of those trapped in the dead end of illegal status. But we're handicapped in addressing these challenges by the central ideological conflict of the age of abundance. As I said before, as a matter of historical reality, the forces of economic dynamism and those of cultural dynamism have been mutually reinforcing. In politics, however, they have been locked in an adversarial relationship. This conflict in its current form dates back to the tumultuous 1960s when mass affluence triggered a mirror image pair of cultural convulsions. On the countercultural left, a romantic rebellion against order and authority of every description, and on the traditionalist right, an evangelical revival of socially and theologically conservative Protestantism. Between them, these two movements have played decisive roles in shaping America's accommodation to mass affluence. But those roles were deeply ambivalent, mixing positive elements and negative ones in roughly equal measure. The countercultural left combined genuine liberation with dangerous nihilistic excess, while the traditionalist right mixed knee-jerk reaction with wise conservation of vital cultural endowments. These two movements thus offered conflicting half-truths. On the left were gathered those elements of American society most open to the new possibilities of mass affluence and most eager to explore them, 
In other words, the people at the forefront of pushing for civil rights and feminism and environmentalism, as well as sex, drugs, and rock and roll. At the same time, though, many on the left harbored a deep antagonism towards the institutions of capitalism and middle class life that had created all those exciting new possibilities. On the right were the faithful defenders of capitalism and middle class mores, but included in this group were the people most suspicious of and hostile to the social and cultural ferment that capitalism and middle class mores were producing. This is the blind versus blind struggle of the culture wars. One side attacked capitalism while rejoicing in its fruits. The other side celebrated capitalism while denouncing its fruits as poisonous. America in the age of abundance has thus been tossed and turned by ongoing and inconclusive ideological conflict. Though the country has made real strides in adapting to new social uh, conditions, it has done so by lurching alternately leftward and rightward. And all the while, the emerging new cultural synthesis has had to contend with scorn from both sides of the ideological divide. To the chagrin of true believers on the left, the embrace of more progressive values, in particular greater equality for women and minorities, has been spoiled by the continued vitality of competitive, commercialized capitalism and the ascendancy of a populist, patriotic conservatism in politics. And to the equivalent mortification of their counterparts on their right, the triumph of capitalism and the resilience of core middle class values regarding work and family and nation have likewise been spoiled by the now irreversible shift towards a more secular and hedonistic culture. This conflict is still with us today in the form of the polarized politics of red America versus blue America. The good news, though, is that this polarization mostly concerns minorities of true believers and their media talking heads rather than uh, the bulk of ordinary Americans. Most Americans, it turns out, stand on a common ground whose coloration is not recognizably red or blue. Call it a purplish, libertarianish centrism. Or, following my commenter, call it bourgeois bohemianism. On the one hand, Americans embrace the traditional values of patriotism, law and order, the work ethic, and commitment to family life. At the same time, though, they hold attitudes on race and sex that are dramatically more liberal uh, than those that held sway a generation or two ago. Likewise, they're deeply skeptical of authority and are strongly committed to diversity and tolerance. Such an amalgamation of views is flatly inconsistent with any current definitions of ideological purity. So despite all the talk about raging culture wars, most Americans are non-belligerents. Since the 60s, American society has undergone sweeping cultural and economic changes that have pushed the country into a decidedly libertarian direction. On the cultural side, traditional attitudes about race relations, sex, the role of women in society, the role of religion in public life, the permissible limits of artistic expression, and the nature of American cultural identity have all taken a beating. The cultural culture is now much more tolerant and pluralistic than before. Meanwhile, our economy is now much more competitive, entrepreneurial, and globalized than it was in the old days of the big government, big business, big labor triumvirate. Price controls and entry restrictions have been lifted in transportation, energy, communications, and finance. Marginal income tax rates have been slashed. Trade barriers have been lowered. Uh, unionization of the private sector workforce has collapsed. The fact is the allowable scope for competition and creative destruction in both the cultural and economic realms is far broader today than prior to the 60s. If not a libertarian era, we are surely living in a libertarianizing era. But our political categories are lagging behind the new social realities. The movements of left and right continue to be organized around discontents with the new, more libertarian synthesis. Thus, the reactionary claims of decline and fall we hear from both sides. The right wails about cultural and moral decline, while the left gnashes its teeth about economic decline. Think of the leading red meat issues uh, for the conservative movement today. Gay marriage is destroying the American family. An invasion of illegal immigrants from Mexico threatens to overwhelm American culture. Stem cell research is leading us to a brave new world of moral atrocities. Meanwhile, on the left, uh, we have the complaints about rising economic insecurity that I led this talk with, as well as a threesome of devil figures. First, Walmart despite the fact that it's a huge benefactor for low-income families. Second, companies that outsource jobs abroad, despite the fact that such outsourcing accounts for about 3% of total layoffs. Uh, 
And third, the wicked plutocrats who make up the top 1% of earners in any given year, as if the money they make is being taken from somebody else. Our politics today is therefore stuck in a reactionary rut. The right remains unreconciled to irreversible cultural changes from the 60s and 70s, and the left remains unreconciled to irreversible economic changes from the 70s and 80s. Both sides, in classic reactionary fashion, long for the good old days. As I've noted before, both are pining for the 1950s. The only difference is the left wants to work there and the right wants to go home there. To break out of this rut, we need a new, more libertarian politics that embraces the new cultural synthesis of the age of abundance. We need to embrace economic change and cultural change and learn to make the best of both. Unfortunately, uh, the current election cycle doesn't hold out much promise for providing the breakthrough we need in both uh, Republican and Democratic fields. The leading presidential contenders are noticeably short on uh, libertarian instincts, much less rhetoric or actual policy positions. But I don't think self-pity is the right note to end on here. Uh, it's my firm belief that the key to a clearer understanding of where we are now and of the real and daunting changes that confront us lies in sloughing off the fashionable cynicism and despair that typically afflict the sophisticated and well-informed. The fact is, we live in a time of immense progress and opportunity. And even better, we live in the country where, more than anywhere else, the future is being created. That future will surely be brighter if we first recognize how incredibly lucky we are. Thank you very much. Thank you, Brink. Let me just note if there are any people lurking out in the hallway that we do have seats in here. Just ask somebody to uh, allow you to slip past the, uh, the aisle. Uh, and now, please join me in welcoming from the New York Times, David Brooks. It's good to be back at my base. Uh, I'd invite you guys over to the big government conservative think tank, but we don't have one. Uh, we call it the Capitol Building uh, these days. <laughs> White House, the OMB. <laughs> They're not doing it the right way, though. Uh, first, let me uh, dispense with the flattery before I try to pick some disagreements. And, and I just, I, uh, like Rudy Giuliani and the Republicans, I agree with 80% of this book. Uh, in fact, I, I'm a big fan of this nonfiction of the 1950s and 1960s. I think the, the golden age of American nonfiction was between 1955 and 1965, in part because we were in an era of serious public intellectuals who weren't yet sucked into the academy. And so they were doing big books, big thinking, synthesizing a lot of different ideas without getting into narrow specialization and career building, uh, doing the kind of books we have now, which have titles like Power and Glory, Basket Weaving in 13th Century Amsterdam, uh, sort of big title, tiny subtitle. Uh, and so uh, uh, this book has that kind of uh, stimulating breadth to it and synthesizing skill. And also, it's incredibly fun to read. Uh, and so if you read this book without being stimulated, you're brain dead. Uh, and while I'm praising the Cato Institute, let me just take this opportunity to say, and I've said it many times, uh, that the Cato Unbound, I think, is one of the top three or four forums for debating ideas uh, in the country today. Uh, then let me just add an extraneous fact. This book begins with the kitchen debate that Khrushchev and Nixon had in 1950-something. Um, I don't know when. 59. 59. Uh, and this was not a spontaneous event. Uh, this was actually organized and orchestrated by a young man who was the flack for this particular conference and this particular kitchen company. And that flack's name was William Sapphire. Uh, Bill Sapphire was working as the publicist, and he organized uh, Khrushchev to come over and confront Nixon because he thought it would be great publicity. Uh, and he actually took the famous photograph of the two men fighting. So my former colleague, Bill Sapphire, organized that disagreement. Uh, so now, as I say, I, I think it's a great book, and I agree with most of it. But let me begin by picking a few fights. And one starts in history, but I think it'll lead up to the ma major disagreement that we may or may not have. And that is Brink's core argument is that we moved from a period of scarcity to a, a period of affluence. And that changed the culture. And I think that culture did change, but I don't think it was economically determined. 
I think America began in a, as, a, as a nation of affluence. In 1640, in Europe, America was already known as the incredible affluent nation or the affluent part of the world. When the settlers came here in the early 18th century, uh, they noticed two things. They noticed the incredible economic potential of the place. They saw flocks of geese that were so big they took 45 minutes to take off. They would write about the big uh, oysters and things bigger than anything they'd ever seen. They saw the forest stretching on into infinity, and they decided, they decided two things. One, I can get really rich here, and two, uh, God can help me do it. And it was both these moral and this uh, economic drive that really powered the American experience, and it was based from the beginning on the idea of affluence. By 1740, I think, Americans uh, had a higher GDP per capita than Europe. By the American Revolution, Americans were taller than Europeans because their diet was so much better. So affluence is bred into the DNA of the United States. Uh, and it has shaped our culture uh, and made us different from Europe and the rest of the world ever since. And it didn't start in 1950. Uh, as people watched the settlers uh, cross the frontier, one of the things they noticed is they would cross perfectly good farmland because they assumed that something was even better over the next hilltop. And that, that was bred into the American DNA from the very beginning. There was a common theme in American literature, starting with Nathaniel Hawthorne, that then would move up, where a landowner would lead people around uh, the farm and say, here is my tremendous farmhouse. Uh, here is my, my cattle. Here is my barn. And the, get, the visitor would say, uh, I don't see any buildings here. And the, the farm holder would say, well, I haven't built them yet, but they're going to be here. And it was that mentality of seeing the present from the vantage point of the future that grew out of the sense of abundance, that life was going to continually get richer and richer and better, and that salvation would come through that. And that was the culture of the United States from the very beginning. So, and, and it's that culture uh, that I want to highlight more than some radical change in economic uh, conditions for Americas that changed ideas. Because I do think that it's not the, in the big change that created the culture wars in the 1960s, or that happened in the 1950s, was not America suddenly getting radically richer, but that a certain set of ideas just became more popular. And those ideas, as Brink says, were basically the ideas of Bohemia, of the Romantic Rebellion Against Capitalism, which started in Paris in the 1870s, built up gradually in Greenwich Village in around 1900, and then exploded to college students in the 1950s and 60s. And then the opposite idea, which was the defense of bourgeois values, which, because this is an intensely religious country, took on religious form. And so to me, it was the power of ideas that, sh that created the culture war that we know. And I see the culture war identically to Brink as this conflict between these, these two sides, this romantic uh, bohemian rebellion against a religious bourgeois defense. And like Brink, I agree that we had a culture war for 30 years, but it's basically over for most Americans. There may be 10% of Americans on the left who are still fighting it, and there may be 20% on the right who are still fighting it. But we've had this synthesis, and I wrote a book called about bourgeois bohemians, about people who live here and in Bethesda, who seem on the patina on the surface, they seem sort of bohemian, a little uh, countercultural, but they're bourgeois through and through. Uh, and that is the cultural consensus, the cultural synthesis we come to. I think politically we've reached basically a political synthesis that most Americans uh, have come to on whether it's on abortion, where there's a big center in this country, whether it's on gay issues, where there's an increasingly big center in this country, and whether it's on things like even evolution, uh, where there's a, a sort of a synthesis. Now, where I think I begin to disagree with Brink is over the future. And I think the culture war is coming to an end, and something else is going to come to the fore. And the first place I think the future may be different from the way Brink envisions it. He sees a more libertarian future. Uh, we, see, we each see futures that look like us, basically. Uh, so you can uh, discount our incredible egos for thinking that. Uh, but my basic reading of the culture war of the 60s and 80s was that the 60s was an individualistic culture cultural revolution, the 80s was an individualistic economic revolution, and those two have merged. But they were both individualistic revolutions of one kind or another, breaking down big structures in favor of individualism. 
And I think that we've sort of overshot the mark on individualism. And if you look at younger people, I think they're much more community oriented. If you look at philosophers, they seem to be much more community oriented. I think there's a reversion based not so much on ideas, but simply on human nature toward tribe, toward nation, toward group. Uh, and that tribe is, is represented in a sense of uh, fraternity. And that fraternity shows up politically in many ways. It shows up in the desire to make some sort of sacrifice on behalf of the war on terror, which uh, the soldiers are doing, but the rest of us are really not doing. It shows up on a, some anxiety in the public over increasing inequality, which is certainly a fact. It shows up on a whole number of ranges, which is why I think Hillary Clinton and, and other smart politicians are not talking individualistically. Their catchphrase this election season is, we're all in this together. And I think whether it's a Republican version or a, or a Democratic version, that we're all in this together uh, sense is really where the polls lead and where the American culture is. The second reason I, I, where I would differ with um, Brink is that I think we're facing different problems in the future that don't lead toward libertarian solutions. And I'm really following in the footsteps of Tyler Cowen here, who said that in the, in the uh, in the Reagan era and even in the 1960s, if you were a normal person in, in America in 1980, you saw the Soviet Union, you saw the threat of really of a Swedish welfare state and stagnation, and your basic paradigm was that there was, you, your freedom was threatened by government. And so that was the paradigm through which you saw the world, and, and that paradigm powered the Republican Revolution. But the Swedish welfare state is really not a hegemonic force anymore. The Soviet Union is dead. And now I think what you see around the world threatening your freedom is not government, but it's these massive decentralized processes, whether it's Islamic terrorism, whether it's the technical change in society, whether it's globalization, whether it's global warming. So now the threat to your freedom doesn't come from government, it comes from insecurity. <coughs> and so the paradigm I think a lot of voters have in their head is insecurity, security leads to freedom. Security leads to freedom. And I think that makes them a lot less hostile to government because they see government as a source of, of security. And they see ways to use government to enhance their freedom. And so I think that also leads to a less libertarian future. And then the third thing here, and I'm not sure whether Brink or I disagree, and the final thing I'll mention is on the emphasis of culture. I completely agree with Brink that our fundamental problems are not economic, they're cultural. That we have lots of people in this country who do not uh, really pay attention to economic incentives. Do not follow economic incentives. Uh, there's no stronger incentive in this culture than getting a high school degree, and yet 30% of high school students drop out. And that comes from a fact which Alan Greenspan talked about. He said before the collapse of the Soviet Union and the rise of Russia, he thought capitalism was human nature. But after he saw what happened to Russia after the collapse of, of, of the Soviet Union, he said, well, maybe capitalism in, isn't human nature. Maybe it's culture. Maybe performance in a capitalist economy depends on certain cultural predispositions. And I think we are lacking, or large parts of our society and large parts of the world are lacking those predispositions. And the question becomes, can government do anything to change culture? To help change the culture in the third world, in Africa and other places, and to help change the culture here. And I think it can. Uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan had a famous quotation. Uh, where he said, the central conservative truth is that culture matters most. The central liberal truth is that government can change culture. And I basically think government can, if it uh, if it's performs correctly, can change culture. Uh, and the, the one area where I think that's most germane is on the question of social mobility. Brink's absolutely right that living standards are going up, that living standards in America are high, that middle class Americans are uh, <laughs> doing reasonably well even over the last 30 years. Nonetheless, it is certainly true that social mobility is no higher here than in Europe, which is sort of a disgrace, and it may be true that social mobility is decreasing, that a, a, a son's income levels at adulthood are more like his father's than they were 20 or 30 years ago. Uh, and, cer and certainly, we seem to be watching some sort of diminution of social mobility. If you come from a family making $96,000, your odds of getting through college are one in two. If you come from a family making 50,000, your odds are one in 10. If you come from a family making 36,000, your odds are one in 17.
So it's a problem for a capitalist economy when the family you happen to be born into is the primary determinant of how you do in life, not your individual merit. And that's because the family shapes merit. Uh, and the, the, my favorite social science experiment that illustrates this was done by a guy named Walter Michel, who used to teach at Berkeley, now teaches at Columbia. And it's a very famous experiment that some of you probably are familiar with. He took four-year-olds, four put them in a room, and put a marshmallow on a table in front of them. And he told the four-year-olds, uh, you can eat this marshmallow now, but if you wait uh, 10 minutes, I'll come back, and if you haven't eaten the marshmallow, I'll give you two marshmallows. And he sent me the videotapes of this experiment. And the, the fundamental truth is no four-year-old can wait 10 minutes and not eat the marshmallow. But he showed me the videotapes, and the kids are literally banging their heads on the table, trying to distract themselves from the marshmallow. And one of the kids he showed me, the, he used an Oreo this particular day. Uh, and uh, the kid picked up the Oreo, ate out the middle, and put it back uh, on the, and, and that, that kid is now Speaker of the House. But, but the scary thing was that the kids who could wait seven or eight minutes, 20 years later, had much higher college completion rates, and 30 years later, much higher income levels than the kids who could not. The kids who could only wait two or three minutes, or some kids eat, ate the marshmallow as soon as he left the room, they had much higher incarceration rates and much higher drug and alcohol addiction problems. And that's basically because some kids had grown up in organized homes where they had developed strategies for resisting their impulses and some kids had not, even by age four. And if you happen to have been born in that home, then school you can do. If you, if you, born, in a home where you born in a home where you can resist your impulses, you can do school. If you haven't been born in that home, you can't do school, because you just can't resist your impulses. Things get boring, you want to get the hell out of there. And so that's the sort of cultural predisposition that I think you need for, for a ha healthy capitalist economy. And I personally think that uh, government can do some things uh, to help uh, build up the culture of people who don't happen to be born in those fortunate homes. And those things would begin with a sense that you've got to have a low tax rates and a competitive labor markets to create a dynamic society. But they would include things like preschool for kids in incredibly disorganized homes, state-funded preschool. They would inc include things like kids save programs to give kids banking accounts so they'd be thinking about the future. They'd Im include educational reforms to give kids from disorganized home constant contact with people they would love and they'd include things like national service to give teenagers a sense of the world outside. I think all of those things would build up human capital. And so that may be an area where I disagree. Nonetheless, um, uh, this is a, just a, a tremendously stimulating book uh, and Brink is um, going to win the Nobel Prize. <laughs> I'll take two minutes. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you, David. Um, I'm going to allow Brink two minutes to respond. Just uh, a couple of points on, on the issue of America always being a, a country of abundance. Of course that's true. Um, uh, or at least it started out that way. Uh, but I, I make the argument in the book, uh, and you'll see if it's convincing or not, uh, that there is a difference between agrarian uh, abundance uh, uh, based on free land and natural, ample resources and the kind of technological organizational abundance that we have today. It breeds different uh, habits of mind, different values, uh, a different way of looking at the world. Furthermore, there's the uh, not unimportant point that between uh, rich agrarian America and rich uh, industrial America lay uh, poor industrializing America. Uh, David's right that Americans were much taller than Europeans uh, at the time of the American Revolution, but they shrank over the whole course of the 19th century as we imported poor peasants from southern and eastern Europe to man our factories. Uh, and so uh, there was a period in which uh, America went through what had been the normal experiences of all countries around the world, which is that most of your people are dirt poor. And the change from that, I think, uh, had uh, important consequences. Uh, on the issue of us being more community oriented, uh, I think that's true. Uh, I uh, take great stock in the, uh, in the social science work of, uh, of political scientist Ronald Englehart at the University of Michigan, who's done a great job of, of uh, documenting changes in attitudes in dozens of different countries around the world over a course of decades, and he finds a real uh, strong connection between rising per capita GDP and a whole constellation of value shifts that he puts under the title of uh, post uh, 
materialism and post-modernization, uh, but, uh, but an orientation towards uh, quality of life and, and uh, personal fulfillment and community over just acquisition and economic security is, is very much part of that. Uh, but I would say that, uh, that the kinds of communitarianism that we see flourishing today is in the form of a bazillion different little uh, communities, a wild proliferation of subcultures and affinity groups, not the kind of mass community of politics and bureaucracy uh, that defined communitarianism in the 20, uh, 20th century. Um, on the issue of, uh, of uh, stagnant or perhaps declining economic mobility, I can't resist. I just blogged about this today on my uh, uh, blog, BrinkLindsay.com, so you can check out my clever uh, anticipation of, of David's arguments on that score. Uh, I, I will say something I didn't blog about, uh, but that is uh, that uh, there's, there's a sociologist, Dalton Connolly, who has calculated that three quarters of the uh, income differences in the country uh, are attributable to income differences among siblings uh, in the same family. Uh, and so the argument that family is destiny, I think, uh, is true to a certain extent. That is, uh, if you're lucky to be born to a middle class family that's, uh, that's pushing you to be educated and, and to uh, uh, acquire middle class values, that's an enormous boon. And if you're not, that's, that's really bad luck. Uh, but uh, but uh, destiny doesn't end there. Um, but I, I would say uh, on uh, one other point on mobility, uh, this, there was this Pew uh, uh, Center uh, report that came out last week that's gotten some attention, which points out that economic mobility here in the United States is lower than, uh, than that in, or measured economic mobility is lower than that in many Western European uh, countries. Uh, as I explain, that's a function of how uh, mobility is measured, I think, more than anything uh, that's relevant to the basic question of whether we have become a class stratified uh, country or whether we remain open to uh, people with uh, talent and, and who are willing to work hard. I think the clearest uh, proof that the, the measurements have gone awry are uh, that if indeed there's more openness and mobility in Europe, uh, why do the best and brightest uh, in Europe come here uh, rather than uh, the flow going in the other direction? Uh, I'll leave it there, and maybe we can get into big government versus small government uh, in the Q&A, but uh, let's hear what you have to say. Thanks. Okay, let's open this up for questions. Uh, please wait to be called on and, and have a microphone brought to you. Uh, microphones? Right here. Well, both of those. Yes, that's fine. And then hand it back. <clears throat> Bruce Greenberg, Brinkman Publishing Company. Mr. Brooks, uh, what evidence do we have that government intervention has produced positive results in, in improving cultural norms? For example, what's the evidence on Head Start? Well, here I'll follow James Heckman, uh, the Nobel Prize winning economist from the University of Chicago, uh, who points to preschool programs that he studied, the famous ones are the Perry Preschool, and there's a few others he studied. But he says the quality preschool programs have, uh, have had lasting and long-term effects on child achievement. You're shaking your head. Head Start is a much more complicated program, as you know. I think Head Start on balance has had very little long-term effect. But that's because there's no one thing called Head Start. Uh, there are a lot of different things called Head Start. Uh, and and uh, some of them work and a lot of them don't work because the quality of the staff is very poor. The second person I'd point to uh, is a guy named Lawrence Harrison, who was a foreign aid worker who now teaches at Tufts, uh, who writes especially about cultural uh, change around the world. And he points out that cultural change never happens quickly, but if you look at countries uh, that invest in education and things like that uh, at, at reasonably high levels, uh, within a few decades, they see huge uh, economic takeoffs, and I think he points to Chile and Ireland and other countries like that. So the, the lesson is that cultural change rarely happens quickly, and it doesn't happen obviously, but I think just pointing those two, Heckman and Harrison, uh, people do believe it happens, and I do too. <coughs> Excuse me, Phil Harvey, DKT. I'd like to raise the issue of, of conflict. Uh, Brink, you mentioned uh, a continuing um, a conflict of uh, culture wars, left and right, red and blue, et cetera. Mr. Brooks suggests that we are approaching something more closely uh, we could call a synthesis. But it seems to me uh, 
that conflict is not only not bad, but is absolutely essential and, and clearly highly desired by human beings and certainly by Americans. We go to great lengths to create unnecessary conflict uh, and spend a lot of, of, of money uh, promoting it. What is your view then when you suggest that a better world would have less cultural conflict uh, whereas I think we might end up bored to death uh, if we get too too far in that direction. Yeah. We will still have the NFL. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> uh, so you know, I uh, I work for the Cato Institute, so I'm the last person to be uh, uh, pumping for a sort of a bland, mushy centrism as the the end of all of our strivings. Uh, of course. Uh, intellectual and ideological and cultural diversity is a great thing, and we've got more of it than ever before. Uh, the issue is whether we have a kind of a polarization into two rival camps uh, uh, that uh, that I think is different from from diversity of opinion and, and pluralism of opinion. Uh, and and in particular, do we have are we divided into two camps that are basically backward looking uh, in their view of the world? Uh, I, our politics certainly is divided that way, has been divided that way into this red and blue uh, camps in which I think basically the, the right can't get over the fact uh, that the 60s happened and the left can't get over the fact that the 80s happened. And so they're stuck in this reactionary uh, uh, dissatisfaction with the status quo and they demonize each other in large part because demonizing the demos is a big no-no in a democracy, uh, but they're frustrated with this big inert uh, uh, center of the bell curve of public opinion that doesn't buy their sky is falling rhetoric on the cultural side or economic side. So this kind of polarization uh, based on a kind of a reactionary failure to, uh, to uh, d get over spilt milk, uh, I think is unhealthy. And I have the sense with David that it's fading. Yeah, I guess I would just echo that it's we're going to have conflict because we are human beings and we, what the scientists call pseudo-speciate. Uh, if we divided this room in half uh, and we said you people are different from you people, within about a month of living with each other, you'd hate each other uh, because that's, that's who we are. Uh, but the conflicts do change. One thing I meant to mention in my opening remarks, and this backs up Brink's theory of how the basic culture has changed and has changed our politics, uh, is that the demographic voting patterns of red America and blue America are very different. That in red America, the richer you are, uh, the more you're likely to vote Republican. In blue America, income makes very little difference to how you vote. And in a state like Connecticut, income is totally unrelated to voting patterns. And that's because people in Connecticut are extremely rich uh, and have moved on to post-materialist ways of voting. And so they're having a different set of conflicts than I think the people uh, in red America are having or than, than the people than Karl Marx uh, inhabited. Uh, I would just say, and I feel like mentioning Tony Blair who made the point that the old conflicts were left and right, but the new conflict is really between open and closed, between people who believe in an open economy, open borders, open competition, and people who fear uh, or, d or do not believe in open borders, open competition, open trade. And that would be a new sort of conflict, which it would cut across our current political alignment. So we're going to have conflicts. The question is, how do they evolve and how do they reflect the real problems? Back there in the aisle. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, Brink, um, Bob Capozzi from uh, freeliberal.com. Uh, do you in your book, or could you address here for us the difference between abundance and happiness? For instance, at least in my observation anecdotally, and I think a lot of people share this, uh, we have a, a, perhaps a situation, we've developed a situation where perhaps you might view it as the diminishing marginal utility of abundance is really tantamount to numification of America. You know, I mean, how many more, uh, you know, DVD players and TiVos do you really quote unquote need and you know the increased use of uh, antidepressants and um, you know the, the need to uh, you know go on uh, Caribbean holidays uh, four times a year etc cetera, etc cetera. is this really something that we should be celebrating or is this uh, perhaps an indication that uh, something's gone terribly wrong we should be celebrating uh, the happiest people in the world are the richest people in the world. Uh, 
if you look at the countries that uh, there's a, a big cottage industry these days of happiness research, and let me first of all uh, plug my colleague Will Wilkinson, uh, who just uh, last month or so uh, published a, a Cato policy analysis on happiness research. I think it's really uh, first rate, excellent, incisive. Uh, we also hosted a uh, Cato Unbound forum on, uh, on happiness. Uh, a month or two ago, you can check that out. Uh, so we, we dove uh, quite deeply into these issues. Uh, but bottom line, uh, the results of happiness research, uh, which uh, has, you know, should be taken with uh, several shakers of salt, uh, show uh, that uh, self-reported uh, life satisfaction is much higher in the countries most afflicted by all the banalities and evils of consumerism, uh, much higher than it is in countries where people are poor and worried about losing kinfolks to disease and terrible things like that. Uh, there's a prop, there is a, a well-reported and much discussed uh, uh, disconnect between rising uh, the, the slope of rising per capita GDP and the slope of rising self-reported happiness. Uh, part of this is math. Uh, if you have uh, per capita GDP that can go on forever and you have uh, happiness on a scale of 1 to 4 or 1 to 10, uh, you're going to see diminishing returns of uh, happiness to, uh, to increases in, in per capita GDP just as a matter of mathematical necessity. I, I think, uh, just to make one additional point on the score, uh, the fact is uh, that we do have limits on how happy we can be. We just can't go around in a sort of a stupefied uh, uh, bliss out uh, 24 hours a day. Uh, it's it's just not adaptive, right? If uh, if if the uh, dwellers on the African savanna were just blissfully happy for the rest of their lives after eating one meal, they wouldn't have gone out and get the, gotten the next meal. So we are we are hardwired to have our pleasures be relatively fleeting. What we have done with our incredible riches is maintain a very high level of happiness through an ongoing process of economic growth, and I think that's a great thing. Okay, right here, and uh, while we're waiting, uh, up there. Lisa? Yes, you can go ahead and hand it to her. Okay, it's there, David, you go first. David Brooks, may I uh, invite you to revisit the confidence that you seem to place on the public sector in bringing about the lessons of deferred uh, satisfaction amongst the, uh, the, the lower class families. Um, how can we uh, sense that those politicians that get into office and our bureaucrats will in fact themselves practice a deferred uh, <laughs> <laughs> satisfaction? Um, I think we do know that from government we can uh, expect unexpected consequences. On the other hand, we do have this uh, ubiquitous private sector such as the Sunday schools that do teach uh, defer satisfaction yourself in favor of your neighbor and the Boy Scouts that teach uh, 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 honor and in loyalty those those kind of attributes that affect the culture uh, would you have something to say for uh, influence of the private sector well I confess when I go up to Capitol Hill and interview members of the Senate and the House I deferred Gratification is not the first thing that comes to my mind when I talk to those people. Uh, nonetheless, I, I think it is clear to, to, um, to make clear what is the basement, what is the foundation of human capital development. And I personally, I'm all for Sunday school, unless I happen to be going to it, but, but uh, I don't think it's preaching. And I think the study on abstinence education recent, was recently clear. Preaching to people, I, I, I think, has some effect. Uh, we all, that's our job. We preach to people, so we hope it has some effect. But the main, the main effect in changing uh, behavior and behaving, changing the way children's minds work is to have someone they love be with them all the time and to organize their home so that their, their uh, decisions have long-range consequences. And there are programs, and these are government programs, I'm all for the private programs, but these are government programs that basically send nurses and older women basically into the homes of disorganized households. And these programs do show results. And that's because if you go into these households, it's not that the parents don't read to the kids, there are no books. They don't even know what a book is, these kids. And, and these programs send a regular, stable presence into the home and create a 
permanent relationship with the child. And in, as we know, emotion is what activates learning. And uh, these programs actually do have measurable results. And the problem, of course, is it takes 20 or 30 years to, to sh play out. But if you ask yourself what caused uh, some sort of uh, development in your own life, it's a stable presence. And so I don't support government programs to give a stable presence in the lives of middle class kids. Their parents are better. But for kids who don't have it, then I, I think government actually can effectively step in. OK, in the back and then here. Uh, yes, um, my name is Martin Worcester. A uh, question for Mr. Lindsay. Um, if America is becoming more libertarian-ish, then why is government constantly becoming bigger, more powerful, and more nanny-ish? Well, it's not constantly becoming that way on all dimensions. Uh, we have had, I think, dramatic libertarian reforms in the cultural sphere on, on civil liberties, uh, on censorship, uh, on uh, uh, gay rights. <clears throat> and we have had enormously important uh, market-oriented libertarian economic reforms, as I mentioned, the wholesale elimination of economic regulation, price and entry controls, uh, the move from a world of 90% tax rates to uh, uh, to tax rates in the 40s today, <clears throat> uh, uh, globalization, the reduction of of, uh, of tariff uh, rates and other non-tariff barriers. So I think we have, uh, relative to the uh, to the 1960s, made giant leaps in a libertarian direction. Uh, by no means, though, <clears throat> to uh, to the extent that would please the folks with very high standards here at the Cato Institute. Uh, we still have a love affair with uh, with big government. There's a there's great popularity uh, for a lot of big spending programs. We have very deep, widespread public misunderstandings of how economics works and therefore a mistrust of the market. Uh, just in September of last year, there was a poll in which 42% of Americans said that the recent decline in gas prices uh, had been engineered by the Bush administration, that they had pushed uh, the gas prices up over the summer so that they could fall in time for the election. Uh, people who subscribe to that kind of conspiracy theorizing are not the kind of people who are going to sort of naturally cotton uh, to the spontaneous order of, of uh, 200 percent uh, pro-market policies, but we're making progress. But Brink, isn't it nonetheless true that the richer a country is, the more likely it is to have a big government? Isn't there a pretty strong correlation between these two things? <clears throat> I think that uh, the more productive your economy is, uh, the bigger a government you can afford. Uh, and, and so one of the uh, sort of... Uh, uh, dark lining to the silver cloud uh, that, that we took away from the experience of the 70s and 80s uh, is that libertarians and free market folks had been warning uh, that we had a too interventionist economy and too big government and it was going to cause complete collapse. And in the 70s, those warnings uh, looked like they were coming true. Uh, but what happened was, instead of a total collapse, uh, we made enough economic reforms uh, to, uh, to put uh, the great capitalist growth engine back in pretty good working order so that we can afford uh, a lot of dead weight. Uh, and so we, I don't think that there is, uh, uh, I think there is a, a sort of an equilibrium with a pretty big sized government and it's hard to chip away at it. And so uh, the kind of rhetoric and kinds of policies that, uh, that worked politically in 1981 when Ronald Reagan came into office are just different because we've become victims of our own success. Uh, that doesn't mean, I think, though, that, uh, that we are doomed to ever expanding government uh, or that we are doomed to think that social policies uh, concocted in the 1930s are the final word in how to deal with uh, old age and medical care. Uh, David, I want to ask you a point of clarification on that. I'm thinking that, that when you say the, bigger, uh, the richer a country is, the bigger its government, you mean among developed economic democracies, right? Because if you looked at the Economic Freedom of the World Index and you took the 20% uh, and, and, you, and you divide it into the quintiles of economic freedom, clearly those quintiles track GDP, and so the richer the country is, in fact, the, the more economic freedom it has would seem to be yeah. the conclusion from that. <laughs> it's true. I hadn't thought about it. I've seen both charts, though. Yeah, I, I, uh, and, and the other chart uh, does seem to hold true as well, and it is certainly true that where I live in Bethesda, which is a 
highly affluent place, my neighbors are not libertarians. Right. I think it they depends. want government spending on everything you can possibly imagine. Right. It depends on how you define big government. Uh, if big government is interfering with market mechanisms, uh, then, uh, then the rich countries are the ones in which market mechanisms have the freest play institutionally and, and from a policy perspective. Uh, but uh, when it comes to redistributing some of that income, then clearly the richer you are, the more you can afford to redistribute some of it. Uh, but that doesn't mean that's the best way to do it. It doesn't mean that a progressively better educated, more sophisticated electorate is going to always be satisfied uh, with programs that were concocted uh, again uh, now uh, 70 something years but, ago. But that doesn't lead to libertarianism. It leads to my saint uh, Hamiltonianism. A uh, belief in limited but energetic government. So it, as I say, we all think the future looks like us. So. <laughs> well, except the libertarian Jeremiads that we frequently have yeah. here, who think the future looks exactly the opposite of us. But <laughs> in this case, that's probably right. Here. Uh, Bill Niskanen, Cato. I'm surprised that neither of you addressed the major potential new source of conflict, and that is between generations. Thirty years from now, American workers will pay marginal tax rates of 10 or 20 percent percentage points higher than they do now in order to pay for promises that American politicians have already made to the future retirees. That is a big source of potential conflict that we've never had before and it is not clear that the American, how the American political system is going to sort that out. I, I think uh, in my book I talk a lot about another generation gap, the cultural generation gap between the Depression World War II generation and the baby boomers, and, uh, and that was an enormous one. Um, but uh, you're right that the sort of policy generation gap uh, based on the long run financial uh, unsustainability of, uh, of our entitlement commitments is, is a train wreck that we can see you know, uh, coming ever closer to, to occurring. Uh, here, I think, is another reason why ultimately uh, the uh, future lies with uh, not necessarily radical libertarian changes, but with ongoing uh, process of, of libertarian-inspired reform, which is that our current programs uh, don't work, and they're going to blow up. And unless we are, uh, can reconfigure them and reimagine uh, the kinds of commitments we make and rely much more on individual initiative to save during the working life for the costs of retirement, uh, we're going to go bankrupt. Uh, so in the medium term, that may ultimately lead to a bigger government because as the baby boomers retire, the costs of paying for at least some portion of those commitments uh, rises and tax rates may uh, increase to, to cover some of that. But I think over the long term, it means a reconceptualization of these commitments and I think moving in a direction that's more dependent upon individual initiative and less dependent upon monopoly, one-size-fits-all, top-down programs. In my interviews with politicians, I often ask them, how can we shift the burden from the affluent, the tax burden uh, from struggling families to the affluent elderly? And they dodge the question with great alacrity. Uh, the only uh, one person who hasn't dodged it and who I've seen speak about this in public is Fred Thompson, actually. In his speeches this year, he talks, he says, if you ask senior citizens to pay a share a burden and, and so they so that the younger generation can have a welfare state or entitlements that they can actually afford. His claim is that people over 65 would be gl glad to make that sacrifice. And he's going to try to test that theory in the election. I, I suspect in about a week he's going to have little old ladies chasing him out of parking lots, uh, a la Dan Rostenkowski from a few years ago. But uh, I don't, I'd be curious to hear you. My view is that the way to trick s seniors into paying more of their fair share of the burden is a consumption tax. Uh, which wouldn't ag aggressively address their uh, uh, their their income at least up front, but would subtly take away would shift the burden a little. Okay, back there, and then right here in front of the camera. Hi, uh, Matt Panic. Uh, my question is for Mr. Brooks uh, on the point that. Uh, government used to be the main threat to our freedoms, or at least the main perceived threat to our freedoms, but now it's insecurity that is the main threat. And uh, even if you're right about that, it doesn't necessarily seem to follow that lack of government is the solution to this new threat to our freedoms. And even in the examples you, you cite, quite the opposite, it seems to me, is that government is the main cause of these, of these insecurities. Uh, as bin Laden tells us, as any Muslim fundamentalist we've heard from tells us, it's American foreign policy bungles in the Middle East that has caused us to be a target of these de decentralized networks of terror. So my question for you is, does it bother you 
that uh, the tendency of government to have uh, unforeseen and unintended negative consequences. Well, you play Ron Paul, I should play Rudy Giuliani. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I, I fund, like, like uh, Rudy, I fundamentally disagree that bin Laden attacked us because of American policies. Obviously, there was, it's a much more complicated issue than it played out in that presidential debate. But nonetheless, I, I think among the reasons that Islamic fundamentalists attack us, uh, uh, American policy toward Israel, or whatever you want to call it, is, is a second or third order effect. The... Uh, Islamic radicals who read this guy, Kutub, he came here, he came to uh, a church social in Missouri, he saw men and women dancing together, and he decided he hated America. Uh, and so he's the major ideological influence on a lot of the terrorists. And so I think those, uh, those are not generated solely by American foreign policy. Uh, and then the other issues I don't think are created by, uh, by government either, the, the leap to an information age economy. Uh, unless you believe Al Gore, that wasn't created by government. Uh, and uh, neither is the effects of, of globalization and the rise of Chinese and Indian workers. Uh, so I don't think government is responsible for those things. Uh, that doesn't mean I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a Hamiltonian. I'm not a, uh, a New Deal liberal. Uh, it seems to me the argument is over uh, how we're going to address these problems. And I do think the reason that go government has increased its spending uh, since Gingrich, really, uh, is because even Republicans who have to answer to the American people need to provide some sort of positive agenda. And it can either be a New Deal statist agenda or it can be a positive agenda that creates maximum freedom and choice, which should be the Republican agenda, but it should not be, uh, we're not going to help you solve your problems. Yeah. Well, let me just address the, the, this broader issue of the politics of insecurity, and uh, I think it goes to, to answering a kind of a puzzle. Um, I'm... Uh, thought of as a kind of a squishy, uh, moderate libertarian, at least by Cato's standards, and, and David's thought of as a kind of a squishy, moderate conservative by right-wing standards. And so it really isn't surprising that if the two of us sit down and, and chat about specific public policy issues, uh, we can either agree about a lot or, uh, or split the difference and come up with something that both of us would think would be a big improvement over the status quo. And yet, why do we sound so different? Why does it sound like we want to take the country into two totally different uh, directions? And I think it has to do a lot with political rhetoric and political vision, and specifically with David's idea that we need a politics of insecurity, a politics based on fear and based on worrying about the future and based on therefore repairing to the, to the warm and comforting bosom of authority that's going to take care of us. And I think, boy, we've just been through six years of that, and we are sick of it. Uh, we don't need a politics of fear. And I don't, think, I don't think it suits the direction in which this country is heading. Uh, a generation that spent its toddler years uh, watching, the rug ra watching Rugrats and then spent its uh, childhood and teenage years watching Simpsons and now in college is watching Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert. This is a, you know, a, a, a generation that has anti-authoritarianism in its DNA and the idea that it is going to respond to uh, you know, some sort of great leader and national greatness uh, I think is just uh, is just completely off base. What we ought to have is a politics of self-confidence uh, and hope uh, that we are a great country. We are the richest country in the world. We're getting richer. Things are getting better. Of course there are problems, but our system contains within it the answers to the problems that arise. That to me seems like a much more attractive uh, kind of politics and one much more in sync uh, with where the country is headed. Yes. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad we're still going to have the NFL. We may have to pay a lot of money to watch it down the road, but thank you for saying that. Um, I'm going to address this question to both Mr. Lindsay and Mr. Brooks. I, I, will, I will preface it by saying, um, Mr. Lindsay, what you're presenting sounds to me pretty much like the clonization or Stepford Wives of America, and that bothers me. I do not think that government, Mr. Brooks, is the answer. And yes, Head Start does work because I've worked with the program for many years, and it's very good. Getting to the political issues, because I think that's very important as we look down the road to what's going to happen in our country, I think there are more independent-minded voters and thinkers today than folks here want to address them. I don't just mean here the Cato Institute, but here in D.C. And I think if you look towards the Midwest and the West Coast, there are more people who are thinking independently and don't like either parties. So I'd, I'd just like your comments on what you think about the Unity 08 movement that is beginning to um, move up and looking at finding bipartisan candidates to run for president and other offices. And could we have 
a third party springing up shortly. Thank you. Well, if, if I left the impression that I see a vision of a kind of a cloned Stepford Wives kind of America, boy, I've, I've not communicated very well because I, I think in my book I portray a completely opposite kind of dynamic going on, that we are in an age of just incredible uh, cultural speciation, as, uh, as David put it, but in a nice way uh, where, uh, uh, where we belong to a whole bunch of different subcultures and affinity groups and, uh, and communities, and uh, we uh, are ever more able to uh, develop our own individuality uh, based on the proliferating choices that uh, uh, that wealth creation gives us and uh, and that's a great thing uh, as to the unity 08 movement I think kind of split the difference centrism is uh, is never very appealing uh, and and uh, it, it it's never the answer uh, the answer is to transcend uh, the deadlocks that you have not to try to split the difference between them what we need I think is not just a little from column A and a little from column B, uh, but uh, a new kind of, uh, of political uh, vision and rhetoric that I, of course, uh, think ought to be uh, <clears throat> emphasizing uh, the libertarian aspects of American political culture. Um, I do think that the Unity 08 and what's going on in the Republican and Democratic fields suggests that although uh, my hopes for a you know a, for a, a more explicitly libertarian politics aren't uh, on the horizon. We do seem to be drifting away from the uh, just cartoonish hostility levels of red versus blue that we've had in recent years. Uh, on the Republican side, most obviously, uh, we don't have any of the leading contenders that really fits very well with this typical uh, the 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 red meat agenda of the uh, red state base. And on the Democratic side, the two leading candidates, Clinton and Obama, are striving very hard to portray themselves as moderates and centrists and uh, to the dissatisfaction of the true believers in the net roots and, and blue state base. So, uh, so I think we're drifting away from this kind of polarization, but where we're going, uh, who knows? Yeah, I'm, I'm also suspicious of the, the center that has no ideas. One of, I tell centrists, you know, the reason you guys lose all the time is because uh, if you go to a conservative dinner, there are think tankers with ideas. You go to a liberal dinner, there are academics with ideas. You go to a centrist dinner, it's all lobbyists. Uh, they have no ideas at all. Uh, and so and I, a center that just sort of drifts in between is just a, it's just a social position. Uh, it's not an intellectual position. Uh, and so I'm always suspicious of Unity 08 and things like that, in part because you know I was in Israel recently, and Kadima was a third party, a third centrist party. If, you're a th if you create a new third centrist party, you happen to lose your leader then you have nothing. You have no roots to the country. You have no issue. You're just floating out there and you're totally immobilized. So I'm suspicious of third parties for that reason. Uh, nonetheless, I will say that having, sus I suspect that immigration reform is going to fail. Uh, Social Security reform failed. It does seem we are in a position without one dominant majority that can push through le legislation of good or bad, and we're without a center. And so that does create a kind of immobilization that probably is not good, especially with problems like the entitlements problem rolling down the, the hallway. Uh, and so I do think uh, you do need some sort of, I mean, we do need some sort of realignment to get things moving. And I would just say, and, and this is in response to the idea that I'm doing a politics of fear, uh, let me do 15 seconds on what the Hamiltonianism is all about. It's not about fear, it's giving people the tools to compete in a capitalist economy. I mean, it is a fact that 70, only 70% 70 of kids graduate from high school. It is a fact that our college completion rates have barely gone up in 25%. It's a fact that while the world is awash in financial capital, it, the United States is not awash in human capital. And that, you know, if, if uh, one of the things we have to work on is getting people to respond to incentives and giving them the tools to do that. And that's not a politics of fear. It's a politics of helping people take advantage of the opportunities. Um, so it's, it's rival optimisms. Let me just say one more thing about the sort of the, the bland centrism. Uh, I, I do think that there are times when when uh, a period of bland centrism works politically. Uh, we had it in the 50s, uh, where after roiling ideological conflict over the role of government in the economy, uh, we had arrived at the end of World War II with some kind of compromise. That is, the market economy remained, uh, but we had a big overlay of, of big government. And, uh, and both sides decided that was good enough uh, for the time being. And so the, we had all these, this sort of new consensus, and uh, D uh, D uh, Daniel Bell wrote a book, The End of Ideology, and we had the kind of Eisenhower era where uh, 
<clears throat> the liberals were uh, were consensus managerial, not radicals, and the conservatives were uh, content to basically mine the New Deal store. Um, it's possible, I think, that we are today in a in the equivalent of the post uh, class war. Uh, breathing period. Uh, we may now be in the post-culture war breathing period where we've gotten to this, uh, what I argue to be kind of libertarian tie uh, between uh, the forces of the left and the forces of the right, and we may uh, create political opportunities for people who tap into our exhaustion with uh, with that kind of conflict. Uh, but uh, I agree uh, completely with David that uh, that uh, that's these are just sort of br uh, breathing spells uh, because they don't have any ideas behind them. They can't really push the country in any particular direction.